Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this afternoon's strategic dialogue on innovative financing. My name is Porter Delaney. I'm going to serve as the moderator today. We've got a, a great group of uh, discussants here to help us unpack some of these issues. I'll go over just a few of the sort of ground rules about how we're going to work together in this discussion, um, and then we'll dive right into it. So in front of you in your microphones, if you just push the button in the middle, uh, once I call on you or you'd like to chime in and you do that, the cameras will follow that. So please turn it off once you're, you're done, um, and that will keep the flow of things going well. Uh, at the outset, I want to thank Concordia. This is part of uh, an innovative financing coalition that they have managed the last few years. Some of the participants in the strategic dialogue today uh, have been part of that, and it's, it's good to continue this effort. They've set a couple of goals you know, that I may be mentioning because I think the, the discussion today will fit well with that, but mainly just around creating a forum uh, for learning and peer-to-peer -peer discussion on uh, new models and practices for innovative finance. We'll talk a little bit about definitions here in a minute as to what do we mean by innovative finance, maybe drill down into a couple aspects of that, and then facilitating uh, the development of new partnerships, and, and hopefully some of the discussions today can assist with that as well. Um, otherwise, in terms of ground rules, after I provide a little bit of, uh, of landscape just to get the conversation going, uh, I have some questions to call upon you know, individuals around the table, but please just uh, signal me if you want to chime in as well, because we do really want to promote a discussion and not just me uh, going around the table calling individually on folks. And with that, I think I'll, I'll just dive right into it. Um, so with the topic that we have of looking at innovative financing, uh, given the, the context of being here at UN General Assembly, uh, the many discussions that we've all been participating in around addressing financing the SDGs and global and sector-specific financing gaps, I think in particular what we're here to uh, bring experience and expertise around is looking at different models, particularly around blended finance, uh, also discuss some around impact investing that can address uh, what are clear substantial financing gaps, but also recognizing, even as we hear regularly about a $2.5 trillion a year financing gap for the SDGs, uh, there are, you know, studies showing that there's, there's, there's plenty of capital, uh, over $20 trillion, uh, according to a, a new Brookings study, that's being invested in sort of towards SDG-focused uh, um, goals, but it's, it's not getting to the areas that need it the most. And so how are we looking at innovative finance? How are we looking at blended finance, impact investing in terms of reaching uh, the poorer, more fragile environments in greater need. I know that's somewhat you know, obvious at the outset, but you know, just, just to make that point. Um, and then I would say in terms of uh, turning, before I turn to the first set of questions around blended finance and calling on some of our participants around that, I did just want to um, cite a, a few trend lines in terms of the, again, importance of the, the private capital side of this. And so if we go back 60 years and we look in, in a U.S. context around the time of the creation of USAID, uh, but many of the OECD donors, at that time, if capital flows to, to those countries or the developed world to the least developed countries, 85% of that was public capital. And, and today, the numbers are completely the opposite, where it's 15% uh, official development assistance has been maintained. There are strong commitments. It has actually grown significantly in the last 15 years, but grown in absolute terms. In relative terms, it's become quite small vis-a-vis -vis all the forms of private capital. And so trying to figure out today, as we first you know, address some of the, the blended finance models, how can that much smaller portion of global funding be used to de-risk and catalyze uh, the private sector investment? And with that, um, I'd like to, to, to jump right in. Um, maybe I'll, I'll pose my, my, my first question around this. I was actually just coming out of a session with, with Katie Kaufman from OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, and OPIC, as the development finance institution of the U.S. government, has been going through a process of modernization and expansion. It will, uh, in short order, launch as a new U.S. development finance corporation. Uh, but I've observed over the last year or two how uh, OPIC has been engaging in more of these blended finance vehicles in terms of bringing their capital alongside uh, grant donors, alongside philanthropies, the private sector. Uh, of course, marshalling private sector, that's the, the purpose of their agency. But Katie, maybe I can turn to you first just to get a little perspective from OPIC around now how, how do you guys look at blended finance in terms of merging your financing tools uh, with partners, again, from the philanthropic sector and other aspects of the private sector? How do we look at blended finance? Well, we really love uh, free money, raspberry money, any money we can get that can help de-risk um, our investments. 
Um, as Porter mentioned, uh, OPIC is transforming into the DFC. And as we transform and double in size and get new authorities, we're also coming with new mandates to be in the lowest income countries and to also be as impactful as possible with our dollars. So how are we going to do that and produce the return that we must for the US government? And one thing that we've decided to do is be more intentional around sector expertise that is going to have the greatest impact on the people in the places where we invest. And for example, we've decided that healthcare is an important sector as a development finance institution, and also food and agriculture. And so as we're building out our expertise, we're looking for radical collaboration with what would potentially seem like unlikely bedfellows, um, including, I'll just give a quick example of one of those blended opportunities that we've created around maternal health outcomes. Uh, we brought together uh, Merck for Mothers, Credit Suisse, USAID, um, and OPIC to commit 50 million in blended finance for maternal health outcomes in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we're looking at blended finance to help push our dollars to be as impactful as possible. And we're looking to do that uh, particularly across the health and food and agriculture sectors. Thanks, Katie. And as I said, I'll start off with a few questions, but if it, it inspires some uh, some reactions, you guys please just, just chime in. Sean, I wanted to turn to you, just looking at another aspect of the, the U.S. government for a moment, kind of um, complementary aspect here with the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which is enjoying its 15th year anniversary now. Um, and for those of you all that Sean speak to their work but aren't as familiar, the development uh, the, the Millennium Challenge Corporation was established under President George W. Bush with the mantra of eradicating poverty through economic growth. And it has a unique uh, compact structure whereby it engages in, in multi-year grant commitments uh, and infrastructure to, to help uh, address sort of underlying um, constraints to economic growth. And I often hear MCC, your team and yourself, talk about uh, the organization as an, an agent uh, of blended finance. And I'd just be curious to sort of get your uh, explanation is sort of how does the MCC you know, define blended finance and, and, and what ways do you see you're you know, advancing the cause there? Sure. I think, uh, thank you, Porter. I think the, the greatest impact that MCC has, and it's often undersold a little bit, is our ability to incentivize countries and leverage institutional and policy reforms that create the sort of enabling environment that uh, de-risks uh, private sector investment. And so, for example, I'm just giving two examples. In El Salvador, the government um, is, has created and has built into uh, the administration now a regulatory body to examine uh, and, and start to deregulate and make the climate, the investment climate, more business friendly. That was a condition precedent on our grant money coming in uh, and working with the country. In Cote d'Ivoire, President Ouattara made part of his administration, part of the executive branch, something specifically to focus on MCC's criteria and meet the scorecards and attract that grant money. Because obviously what we're doing, it's not loans, it's not leveraged, it's all grants. And so we go in and set that environment and then we engage, we try to engage as much as possible with private sector partners to figure out what the economic constraints in that country are. What are the big holdups on a growing economy in these emerging markets that are the best governed, poorest countries in the world. And once we run those analyses, you know, we, we enter uh, into the five-year period and we put in big infrastructure projects. And what we're trying to do on the blended side is increase our potential impact. More dollars in, there's more impact. And by the way, the more dollars that are in, the greater our ability to incentivize change and reform and create a better enabling environment for more capital. So it's a great sort of circular self-reinforcing system once it starts. Thank you, Sean. And Judith, that's all you wanted to chime in on the back there. Please go right ahead. Great, thank you very much. And I, uh, I wanted to come in because uh, UNCDF and the OECD recently published a uh, report on blending in least developed countries because UNCDF focuses on bottom of the pyramid, 47 least developed countries of the world. That, of course, includes all of the conflict-affected countries, but also 
uh, stable, low-income and some middle-income countries that have a series of, um, of constraints that qualify them for that category. According to the latest OECD data, it's sh showing only 6% of all blended uh, transactions are actually landing in the least developed countries. That 6% is highly concentrated in a relatively small handful of transactions and a very small handful of countries. So it is not representative, and one transaction in one year can completely skew that number uh, bigger or smaller, and it's already quite a small number. So 70% of blending, according to their latest data, is going into middle-income countries and upper-middle-income countries. So that's to give a sense of, um, of scale. In terms of the actual size of transactions, the uh, transactions in the LDCs are mobilizing an average of about $6.1 million for the deal, and the ones in all the other countries are at the $60 million mark or above. So we understand why there are constraints in investing in, in LDCs, but if ever there were a category of countries that was really ready and um, eligible uh, to be targeted for blending, it is the LDCs, and it's something that I think is a challenge for all of us to see how best to make that work. Thanks, Judith. Yeah, actually, the, one of the next topics I wanted to get to is just what you've touched on. I had you know, similar statistics from these OECD um, and UN studies with regard to how little of the even the, the funded finance that's being directed through public development finance institutions is getting to the uh, areas at the bottom of the pyramid that's the greatest need. And in that context, I was going to call on Alex Wane. Uh, the CEO of the Global Innovation Fund, but, but maybe actually in two ways. I was going to call on you, Alex, separately when we were talking about uh, these blended finance tools and how you can bring together uh, you know, grant-based assistance alongside development finance. Global Innovation Fund is a little unique in that it has those tools within one institution. And so maybe talking a bit about what the thinking was in creating Global Innovation Fund, both in terms of having those diverse financial tools, but then also to Judith's point about getting to these areas where there's greater need and less capital being mobilized, which is really the mission of GIF. Yeah, thank you. It, actually, it's a nice um, combination of what Sean mentioned as well as Judith that I think we think about blending both in space and then in time. And depending sometimes on what the overall environment is in the country, one or the other of those things might make more sense. Um, so to give an example and then answer maybe your question, Porter, we recently made a loan to an agricultural company in northern Nigeria called Babangona. And we took a subordinated debt position alongside actually Acumen and a few others um, because we are coming from uh, a place in which we can bear the kind of currency risk associated with investing in a place like Nigeria. But we did this deliberately with a few other impact investors in coordination with a group of senior lenders that would come in on top with dollar denominated debt. And so we're thinking in a very coordinated way about who can bear what risk to crowd in more capital more quickly um, for this company. But one other thing that GIF did there, and that's unique to our capabilities, is we actually tied the interest rate on our debt to the results of a randomized controlled trial to measure the impact of Bob and Gona's work on the welfare of the farmers who are enrolled in their programs. Greater impact than their estimated number, we were willing to take a few basis points off of the rate of interest in which we charged them. And we paid for that grant to measure impact separately. So that's a great example of using all the tools in their toolbox in one place in time. I think you can also think about, um, for those of us who are on this impact spectrum, about getting companies ready for other kinds of finance. So you may not be blending in one particular transaction, but you're thinking about the future and thinking, what does this company need to be ready to access you know, local private equity or other kinds of capital? So when we invest in a company, we often spend a lot of time on ESG, not only because we're investing taxpayer dollars and we need to be, you know, really have a really tight ship on that, be because that company needs to have all those things really ironed out if they're going to come to a DFI um, and be able to be financed or another private equity fund. So we work a lot on governance and with these companies as part of our venture support offering and getting them ready for other kinds of money in the future. 
Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that. Um, so my name is Val Redhorse Mole, and I'm the executive director of Social Venture Circle, one of the oldest um, nonprofits uh, made up of impact investors. And we have found that we have to lead a lot of educational seminars on blended finance. And um, I left a career as an investment banker where I structured transactions for American Indian tribal nations, which are very similar to sovereign finance, uh, don't own the land, and you have some you know, sovereign immunity issues. Um, but that helped me understand achieving the most optimal financing for the client and the company through blended finance. Sometimes I would have seven or eight different tranches of capital for American Indian tribes. And what I found in impact investing globally and in America, a lot of the companies don't even know how to access capital. And there is a disparity in the image of the power. You know, They think they're at the mercy often of the asset holders and the capital providers. And private equity is the model that a lot of companies think they have to um, seek. And so one thing that we find is so important is the education around Specificity, here's some term sheets, here's a non-extractive exit, here's patient capital, here's something you can do with revenue-based financing so you're not having to be forced into something. And this week, I've heard a lot of talk about shareholder value and the disparity in the, in the big capital markets and the big companies. Well, you have to understand, I think we all know, these small companies we're talking about can scale and end up with issues if you've started off with term sheets that can be impediments later on. And so the education around what is available, what to expect when you walk in a room, how you hold something of value, you're not just at the mercy of the money at the other side of the table. And our impact investors really um, think about themselves as being patient capital. So to your point, you know, terms and length of capital can be just as important as how much it costs. So um, I think it, education <coughs> is key so that all of the companies when they are about to seek financing, whether it's grants, because sometimes grants can have things that maybe tie up something as you go to get financing, just, just that education is huge. And I think that is a partnership, um, collaboration. And Valerie, do your investors want to see their money back with returns, or are they giving you grants that you then invest? How does that work? We have both. They're all investing into for-profit enterprises, right. but a lot of them invest through DAFs. And so that, if the money comes back, it just gets recycled. Um, but they want the company. But they get the choice to recycle it, not you. Well, I'm a nonprofit, so I'm just a facilitator. But yes, they, they would get the return back into the DAF um, and then recycle it. It would be their DAF uh, on behalf of their foundation or their family. Um, but most of our investors do not require any sort of fast return, so we are not venture capitalists at right. all. Hi, I am Bernardo Villamon. I am the manager of the Office of Partnerships at IDB, and I wanted to put a little bit also uh, related to the innovative finance models you were uh, commenting on what's happening in Latin America. And uh, basically, the, the gap that we have also in SDGs in Latin America is huge. It's 100, we, according to ECD, we need to invest $650 billion a year. And what we're doing so far, counting our resources, what the governments have put in development finance institutions, around less than 100, uh, a little bit less than 100 billion. So we need to leverage by five what we're doing. And that's why we're figuring out to ramp up our strategy in terms of innovative finance schemes and resources and how to ramp up in three ways. First, trying to work more improving the investment climate, precisely because we need to make the risk and help uh, uh, come out larger investment, particularly infrastructure, and that's why we work in particular in sectors like transport, renewable energy, and, uh, uh, and water and sanitation to bring larger investments to the, to the ground. And we invest in with technical assistance and mobilizing partners to help governments to create that environment. Second, by working more on project preparation. One of the topics we discuss currently with investors is the lack of enough bankable projects, and that's why we're mobilizing resources to prepare projects, and that we're creating a PPP facility. We're working on with other partners like uh, Holland and the Northern Development Fund to create funds to do NDC preparation uh, accelerator facilities to help have more bio projects. And third, by deploying more innovative finance structures, combining different sources more patient capital that can, that can help to de risk and help institutional investor, investors to come in. And we think in Latin America is a very attractive beyond the graduation that we have from many agencies because it's a more middle income region. We have an opportunity for pension funds, institutional investors, because if you want to hit SDGs, you need to work with Latin America. 40% of the biodiversity is in Latin America. 
one third of agricultural land is in Latin America. If you want to talk about food security, you need to work with Latin America. Uh, water, one third of the water, fresh water resources are in elaboration. So we have a lot of opportunities. We're excited about some of the interesting uh, financial structures we're working with, and we can uh, then comment on some of those. Thank you. Jack, I'll, I'll turn to you and then come over to Laura. Thank you. Great, thanks. And the reason, um, Valerie, I was asking you is we also, we have different models of, like you and Alex, philanthropy backed investment backed along a spectrum. And I would say the biggest thing that we've learned over the last 20 years is to look at investment as the means, not as the end. And that so often when we're having these conversations, we start with our financial vehicles rather than, well, what is the problem that we want to solve? And so what we're finding is not only looking at different sectors that will require different kinds of capital, um, but uh, different um, different times in the market's development. So for instance, in, in energy, for the 15 years, we've essentially invested fully philanthropic backed patient capital to try to build markets where they haven't existed before in the off-grid solar space. As the, those companies started to prove themselves, you could build a $70 million for-profit fund. All of its patient, though, we're fooling ourselves if it's not 10 to 12 year kind of capital. But that more recently, as particularly in an era of climate change, particularly as we're looking for frontier markets and the very poor, what do these blended models look like? And we are, we're soon to close a, um, we've done a first close of a agricultural fund that's looking specifically at resiliency and adaptation for smallholders in sub-Saharan Africa. And what's been so exciting is to see all the different players ready to come to the table. The Green Climate Fund has given a 50% first loss because we recognize that the, these farmers are taking such outsized risks that we need to protect the downside for our private senior equity holders. And then they've come in, but then side by side, DFID and other government entities have come in to ensure there's technical assistance money, that there's money for gender analysis and, and gender training, that there's R&D money and, and even communications money. And, um, and then in education, uh, actually looking at recoverable grant models and are finding that both investors, particularly individuals and institutional grant makers and investors, if they understand what their purpose is and what the ultimate purpose of the fund um, is and the timeline um, and their learning together. I think it's just a new, it's a new era, which is so exciting. So uh, fun to hear what everyone else is doing. Uh, thank you, Porter. I just wanted to offer maybe a couple of comments. The first one is that I think that if we look at the, um, you know, the, of the numbers in these past 10 years, we see that there are two very separate stories. So we have a group of countries that are actually more or less doing very well, and they may not be able to get to the SDGs by 2030, but they will be there 2035, 2040. I mean, the trajectory is positive and it's a good trend. And the issue for this country is more the internal inequality. And so the kind of strategy for blended financing is a very different one because it's something that really implies working with the governments to make sure that they redirect in a more equitable way the investments, including their own resources, that they are very capable of you know, raising and therefore investing within their countries. And then there is the unfortunate bucket, the one that we are, uh, you know, many of you raised the point of the least developed countries, the countries that really at the moment do not seem to be able to make it. And then for these countries, I think that there are two big issues. The first one is is really helping overcome the greatest bottleneck in development that we have, which is the infrastructure gap, and uh, how to attract investors uh, you know, to a countries like Liberia or Sierra Leone. It's something that really requires, I think, a much stronger role from the multilateral banks, for example, both in terms of doing what Bernardo was mentioning, which is investing in the least attractive part for investor, which is preparing the project, designing the projects, having everything ready so that, that the project can actually be implemented and be bankable. And I do not see enough of the uh, you know, multilateral bank investing in these things. And the second is thinking about guarantees, that in reality, if we look at the type of guarantees that multilateral banks offer, is a very narrow palette of instruments, and it's very small compared to the share of capitals that they invest in other things. 
things. And I think that that would actually help someone that may be very well inclined to invest in South Africa to actually decide if there is a strong backing from the African Investment, the African Development Bank, for example, uh, to really invest in countries that are, uh, you know, more risky, where the, particularly the political risk, uh, you know, is very high. So I think that it's very important as we think about what to do to make blended finance work, to really think about what kind of different uh, refined strategies we need to have for different typologies of countries. Thanks, Laura. Sean, did you want to go ahead and jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in on the back of that. I think we've found that historically some of the holdup on the private sector engagement on the blended side is the project development piece of it. And that's something that we engage in over a period of many years with our selected partners at MCC, but we've been looking for ways to increase that. And so we've recently, working with Bechtel in Cote d'Ivoire, entered a partnership for a master infrastructure plan, but we are trying to free that up. That's point one. And point two is, <clears throat> in doing that, the way that we work, and this, you know, Jacqueline gets a, sort of the form follows function piece of it, working, part of what our legacy wants to be is how to execute these projects sustainably, mm -hmm. how to go through open procurement, how to assess value for, for money, how to analyze the sustainability overall. And many of the governments that we work with have said to us point blank, prior to our involvement uh, with you all and the, this process, we didn't know how to talk to the private sector. We weren't bidding these projects the right way. And so hopefully that our engagement and that dialogue will help people around this table sort of come together uh, and, uh, and have a greater impact. Please. Thanks for this. So what I would like to do is take the opportunity and shift a bit the discourse into what's happening in middle-income countries and see how um, what was discussed before, the, um, the lower risk of absorption, especially of uh, blended finance, uh, takes place there, and whether the application and uh, and, um, and distribution of such is done in, uh, in rational and effective ways. So I would like to echo uh, Jacqueline's point before on um, investment not being the end target, but actually being a tool of, uh, of, of giving and providing a remedy to things that are going wrong. And what's going wrong in um, a country like Greece, I am Deputy Minister of Labor in Greece, but Minister of Welfare and Social Solidarity there, uh, what's going wrong or what could have gone much, much better than it did is the provision of social services through functioning partnerships. And um, functioning partnerships, meaning the fact that we do not just have PPPs that are ultimately concessions in goods. So what happens in Greece is that we just have concessions in uh, uh, road making or bridge making or even the provision of some services that is for some time under the operation of the private sector and then just, uh, just uh, handed over to the, to, the, to the civil sector, right, to the civil service. Um, but what we need to do, and especially we had a great um, room and space for convergence and collaboration there that is called the migration crisis, being able to form um, partnerships in an effective way. So given the fact that um, in migration we did have on the table all the financing stakeholders, um, these of, uh, um, multilateral assistance, European institutions, these or UNHCR, for example, these of UNICEF, these of other European partners, uh, Greek and international NGOs, and of course the Greek state. Unfortunately, what we did experience was um, a decompartmentalization of each one's role on the table without a functioning cooperation. And why was that? I think it's mostly because it's, it's an asymmetry between problem identification and identification of the problem solution. So each of the stakeholders had different interests and these interests were not aligned. Civil servants thought that and still think that the whole migration issue, I'm dealing not with the migration issue in my ministry, but I'm dealing with unaccompanied minors, uh, which is the most sensitive uh, subject of the refugee crisis. So um, what the civil servants do persist is that this is a transitional stage. What NGOs um, have in mind is that perhaps it's not the best thing to be a transitional stage because there is the need of self-preservation there. 
uh, what the Europeans see is that they cannot exactly define a time horizon, though their financing tools do have a time horizon and do not have a time horizon for bridging projects. So the issue is, how can we have a commitment of all involved stakeholders forming a functioning partnership while we do have competing interests? And there, the competing interests are between the stakeholders, and I'm sure you have more um, experience than me in not just having competing interests between the stakeholders of the issue, but having um, competing interests between the beneficiaries of the financing tools of the, of, of, of the stakeholders and the local population. So when a Greek citizen gets 200 euros a month for his guaranteed minimum income scheme, and then an accompanied child takes 180 euros a day to live in a hotel for an exit strategy um, uh, with, with all of the, of, of the care that, of course, he needs and it should be provided, then there are competing interests that are, um, that are polarizing, unfortunately, the society there, do create political issues which need to be solved, but then these political issues do not concern all of the stakeholders on the table. So I'm leaving you with this. How can we make effective partnerships where interests are not aligned? Thank you. Uh, Alex, I'll turn to you to respond to that, and then I'm going to move us in a different direction. So go right ahead. Just quickly, I, I think it's an interesting space for innovation for all of us thinking, and in less developed countries too, about B to G innovations and investing in those kinds of companies. Um, you know, Sean, you mentioned when you opened us up that there's this opportunity for thinking about MCC and those kinds of institutions to create an enabling environment, then those of us who are investing can actually come in and think about how can we support innovative companies providing services to government. It may not it always be as complex as what you're describing, but we've invested in a company that's providing ambulance services in Nairobi um, and contracts out deliberately to government, or companies that are providing uh, smart meters and pay-as-you-go water services in Mali to get people who originally were in arrears and cut off from service back into service. And those things, when you're speaking with the people who are supporting regulatory reform and infrastructure provision, the impact can be outsized. So I think this idea of aligning incentives and thinking smartly about B to G service provision is a really interesting space for all of us. Thanks, Alex. I, I want to go back to a, a couple of topics which we're hitting on earlier. One being looking at some of the, the structures that are, are working well or that are being developed around um, different blended finance models. And let's turn to a couple of participants here who are, are involved in setting those up. And then secondly, come back a little bit more around impact investing or kind of just broadly as we're looking at banks and investment funds, you know, some of the trends we're seeing and experience there. But on the, on the first piece around the models and partnership, and a, a few folks talked about uh, focusing on the problem first rather than the vehicle. So I'm going to turn to, to Will Moore here, who's the executive director of the Eleanor Crook Foundation. Um, and I'll, I'll basically let him you know, tell the story of what the problem is that they're looking to address. But coming in as a, a mid-sized U.S. family foundation, you know, the, the development finance world was somewhat new to them. They've uh, tiptoed into this space. And I think it'd be an interesting perspective, Will, to hear from you. Thanks, Porter, and it's great to be with all of you today. Um, we're a mid-sized uh, private philanthropy focused on fighting global malnutrition. Um, we're focused on that problem because it remains to be the number one killer of kids in the world, um, and also kids that survive. Um, if they're not receiving proper nutrition in the first thousand days of life, um, they're going to be permanently uh, stunted uh, cognitively, uh, physically, um, which, which impacts um, long-term GDP growth um, uh, across the developing world. Um, so it's, it's a problem that we, we feel like everybody needs to be more focused on, so I got my plug in for that. Um, we've got sort of dragged into this uh, impact investing, development, financing um, world a little bit resistantly. Um, for a long time, uh, we saw ourselves very much as a traditional grant maker, um, and we felt like there was so much to be achieved just by doing grant making towards ending this problem of malnutrition and doing it really well. Um, and just we, we define impact in terms of lives saved and human development, not in terms of economic returns or financial returns. And um, so you know we figured our, our investment shop does the investing, and we do the grant making, and let's leave it at that. Um, but as we become really focused on um, scaling in the nutrition sector, I mean, how are we going to scale up 
um, improve solutions that are really going to get us across the finish line to finally solving this problem. Um, you know, there are really only two pathways to scale and, and international development. Um, you've got public systems, in our case, predominantly health systems, um, and you've got markets. And there are so many advantages um, to going through markets uh, in, term, in terms of driving for sustainable scale. Um, so just as Jacqueline said, I mean, we've, we've come around to looking at um, development finance um, because we think it is a, uh, an oftentimes a superior means um, towards the ends that we care about, which is not the financial returns. It's, it's the returns in terms of lives saved and, and human capital developed. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're now, you know, talking with, with Katie at OPIC and talking with the World Bank about how can we, um, as someone who really, we don't care about the financial returns, how, how can we um, bring our grant capital in um, to help develop and scale these market-based solutions? And I think the mantra that we're continuing to maintain is let's just be flexible. I mean, that's what a private foundation can do. We can come in and, and be flexible and keep that, that end in mind. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're looking at, um, it, it's helpful to hear from all of you all and sort of the, the roadblocks that you encounter often and, and thinking more about sort of the, the investment perspective, but, um, you know, coming in, um, providing subordinated debt, um, being that first loss guarantor, um, also, you know, helping to reduce transaction costs, um, you know, to actually generate, help help generate the deal flow to provide money to, 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 to consultants and firms that can do that. Um, but lastly, I think on the technical assistance front, I mean, um, when we're looking at food systems and private sector-based food system solutions to end malnutrition. Um, if, we're, if we're working through development finance to uh, scale up these food companies, I mean, what might uh, half a million dollars in technical assistance to help a medium food producer, medium-sized food producer, fortify all of its product lines, what might that achieve? So um, I think we're finding that there's a lot of value that we can bring um, by sort of providing that halfway capital between investment capital and grant-making capital capital um, to, to, again, sort of harness this vehicle towards the, the ends that we care about, which is saving lives and, and human development. Thanks, Will. I, I did actually want to turn to, to Mary Ellen as well in that, you know, in doing a little diligence uh, for this session, I, I was reminded of uh, an announcement that was made at the Global Entrepreneur Summit back in June, uh, where uh, Women's World Banking entered into a partnership with OPIC and with USAID. And we just loved, I mean, A, to have you tell a little bit more about the work of your organization, this investment fund that you've created, but also how you've approached partnering with public sector entities uh, to create more impact. Great, my favorite topic. Thank you, Porter. Um, so yes, by way of background, Women's World Banking is a, this year, 40-year-old uh, NGO that has really, since our founding, um, provided, been a technical assistance provider to financial institutions. We originally started working almost exclusively with microfinance institutions, and then as, um, really, as digital technology became the major um, channel for delivery of financial inclusion, the partners that we started working with really exploded. So today we're working with banks and fintechs, insurance companies, cell phone companies. And it's still in that, that um, technical assistance provision model. But about eight years ago, we found that um, when microfinance institutions in, in particular were becoming regulated for-profit companies, you were seeing a dramatic drop off in the service of those institutions to women. And terrible things were happening to the gender diversity at the board level, the management level, and staff level. And so we actually kind of stumbled into becoming an investor in order to shore up really those two things. We wanted to be a capital provider that made sure that that those two uh, outcomes were not uh, were not the case, as it it turned out, um, we just I don't think really envisioned that we would be able to have quite the impact that we are having inside the organizations by being on the board, by being on the board and still providing the technical assistance. You can kind of put your money where your mouth is. You carry a whole lot more a whole lot more clout. You can make sure that when capital rounds are done, the others that are around the table are are, are like minded. 
And so when we deployed our original 50 million and, and are now in the, the harvesting phase of that, we decided we would, would try to raise a second fund. And very early on, actually, in our, our capital raise, um, even prior to the conversation with, with OPIC, we were very pleasantly surprised, and people still kind of look at me dubiously when I say this, um, that the European Union was willing to come in and acted. Nobody ever hears European Union and acted very quickly in the same sense, <laughs> but they reacted remarkably quickly in providing a first loss facility um, for the fund with a special focus, Judith, on on our investments in the LDCs and you know in pushing us very deliberately to be thinking about countries, post conflict countries, and areas where we might not have invested, and that you know sort of win. Beneath our sales, it was it was seven million euro with a three million technical assistance, you know, sort of sidecar. Um, we started to look a lot more attractive to other investors because at least there was there was that piece of um, uh, of first loss, and so we ended up having conversations with a couple of other first loss providers, including USAID, which has been wonderful. And in fact, they are not limiting their first loss to a particular region; it's for the global portfolio. And there's an, another DFI that will. You know, knock on wood. We never say things until they're they're closed. But we'll be joining USAID. So the total first loss is is going to be just about 20 million, depending on what the euro US dollar uh, interest rate is on the day we close. Um, but then it it just made the conversation with private sector and DFI investors, you know, just a very very different one. And I I was really delighted that. The initial response to many of the DFIs, frankly, of working with OPIC is, you know, no, uh, you're going to have to make a choice between us. And I think some of the exciting developments at OPIC have really changed, the, certainly the way the DFI community was looking at them during our capital raise, but certainly now as uh, OPIC is making, making that transformation. But I, I think... It's been, it's, you know, I had a, a long career at the IFC, and so I, I know how inflexible these organizations can be. I must say, in the, in the context of raising our second fund, there has been that kind of flexibility. There has been a real understanding of what it is we're trying to achieve uh, with the fund, and we've just been very, very pleasantly surprised at at how willing the, the public institutions have been, you know, to work towards our goal and maybe even change some of the, the ways that they've looked at some of these structures in the past. Thanks, Mary Ellen. And maybe give uh, Katie a chance to kind of uh, speak to your, your comment about OPIC and as it's evolving into this new U.S. Development Finance Corporation, some of the, the different tools and how that uh, enables better partnering, but then also maybe just to pick up, you, Katie, talked a little bit earlier about some specific models of partnership, but now that we've talked about Women's World Banking and their investment funds, to talk a bit about 2X and, and the particular portfolio that you lead um, at OPIC, and it's less of, I guess, maybe a, you know, a blended finance, but it's certainly a, a partnership structure that you've built out through the G7 and now beyond, so maybe those, those two kind of points. So you want about how, how is the new USDFC going to be a better partner? We've been talking about partnership. And then secondly, maybe just giving us uh, some updates on the exciting work around 2X, both within OPIC and then with multilateral partners. How much time do we have for the strategic dialogue? <laughs> Um, how are we going to be a better partner, thanks in large amount to Porter and some others' effective educating strategies on Capitol Hill, um, where OPIC currently does not have the authority to invest with equity, which makes it difficult um, when we're working with our European, particularly our European sister development finance institutions. When we launch as the DFC, we will have equity authority. We'll also have some technical assistance, um, and we'll double our investment capability. So I think. Broadly speaking, we are going to be a much more flexible, uh, much more impact-motivated institution. Um, previously, OPIC had these restrictions, so when we're trying to make investments in some of the hardest-reached places, we're also looking for a U.S. shareholder in the mix, and that just doesn't work all the time, and it's not our mission. Our mission is to support private sector growth, not to support U.S. exports or U.S. enterprises. So that re requirement is, is sort of going away, and now we're going to be looking at not what fits into our little box that we currently must mold ourselves into, but 
what's actually the most impactful investment that we can make and how can we crowd in our sister DFIs? And I'll use that to shift over to the 2X conversation, um, which 2X at OPIC is our first ever uh, women's economic empowerment initiative um, around since 1971 as a development finance institution but remarkably never caring about gender, never caring about health, never caring, we have a lot of work to do so that we can better invest with our sister DFIs. Um, but we launched 2X as a billion dollar uh, initiative to invest in women. And then during Canada's G7 presidency, we brought together all seven, I think it's the first time ever that the G7 DFIs came together for a common aim and committed to $3 billion for women owned, led and supporting enterprises. So thank you so much for letting me get that in there. We're about <laughs> 2.47 billion into that $3 billion commitment. And, and of course, Women's World Banking is a, par is a part of that portfolio. Thanks, Katie. And, and, and IDB Invest, absolutely. Um, thank you, Katie. And, and while we're sort of on the, on the topic of, of you know, sort of mo mobilizing more resources for uh, social impact, I did want to turn to Elsa. We were talking a little bit yesterday. We ran into each other here at Concordia. Um, she's giving a bit of insight in terms of Barclays and some of the uh, bold commitments they've made about how they can shape their uh, financing and, and shape the, the investment um, sector with regard to environmental social impact. So one, just would be great to hear a little bit about sort of Barclays' uh, approach and, and sort of what are the ambitious goals that uh, you've set for yourselves. And then secondly, uh, many of you probably took note there was uh, a launch on Sunday um, with UN Secretary General Guterres of the UN's new principles for responsible banking. And Barclays was a, a founding member of this group, and so it would be great if you also could share a bit about that initiative and, and why you chose to be a leader at the outset. Thanks, Porter. Hi, everyone. Thank you for in including me. Um, I, you know, as I've been listening to everyone, I've been reflecting on where does where do the large institutional investors fit in this conversation? And surely we have to play a role in all of this. And, and I think really probably the most helpful thing we can be doing at this point is f reframing our own approach to finance from the inside out, thinking about the role of banking um, and what this actually means for the global community, not just in showing up where there's commercial opportunity with no account whatsoever for the social and environmental aspects involved therewith, but how might we start um, being a conduit for change quite literally through the allocation of capital. Um, and so we've, we, I'll talk first about the principles for responsible banking and why we were involved in that, and then we can certainly get into other, other bits of this as well. Um, so as, as Porter mentioned, this was launched on Sunday, uh, which was very exciting. We were one of the original 30 banks that were part of the consultation process. So this was a year in the making, actually much longer than a year, really. Um, and, and it's important to note that it was not only the banks involved, but lots of NGO partners and other entities who were part of the conversation and thinking about how might we set forth an ambitious new approach to, um, to accounting for what banks should be doing and what is our role in, in providing um, value for society. The whole point here is that we're aligning, we have made a commitment to align our strategy to support the goals of the Paris Agreement and the, and the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, that's quite broad when you just say it that way. What does that actually mean? <laughs> and that's really what's gonna start counting when we uh, get into the development of this. Um, importantly, this was not just, Barclays is actually one of the larger banks uh, involved in the PRB. There's a lot of smaller banks from across uh, the globe who are part of this, which is a really important part of the conversation because it's important that those of us who might be a bit farther along in being able to measure um, our, our uh, impact both um, and risk, frankly, both with regard to climate but also uh, societal developments, that we can share that and be supportive of the whole ecosystem moving forward. Um, so we've given the whole cohort a four-year time frame, which frankly I think there was a lot of pressure on all of us to make that a much shorter time frame. Um, I will go ahead and say voluntarily that that those of us who are who have been given a, a head start should be hitting these sooner than than perhaps some of the smaller banks in development um, contexts that might need a little bit more support from the rest of us. Um, but I think really importantly, there's there's some very specific goals that we've signed up to. Transparency and accountability obviously is a big part of this. Again, words we hear all the time when it comes to banking. Uh, fundamentally, we're going to have to start outlining exactly how we're going to measure our um, exposure and our impact when it comes to uh, climate-related risk 
an opportunity and also certainly the SDGs. This, I think, aligns uh, importantly with some of the other frameworks that we've either voluntarily signed up to or are seeing come down the pike uh, from our regulators, which is an important part of the conversation here, I think, as well. We are signatories to the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure. Um, it's a mouthful, and it's a real opportunity for us to think about, again, how do you actually do scenario analysis and stress testing to look inside your own portfolio and see what, where there's actual substantial risk um, from a climate related perspective, and then how do you disclose that publicly? And then how do you take the steps to start minimizing that risk and, and allocate more capital in the direction of, of proactive new technologies, climate mitigation strategies, et cetera? Um, I think all of this comes down to fundamentally having the right sets of data, and that's an area where I think we can all work together. Um, just in thinking about solutions, uh, certainly one of the spaces where <laughs> Banks have struggled um, substantially, most specifically related to climate, but this applies elsewhere, is thinking about how you have the right sets of data. If we're thinking about dramatic climate change or even subtle <laughs> over the next number of years, um, how do you measure uh, physical risk? How do you measure trans uh, transition risk? What does this actually look like for us inside our portfolios? How are you using the same sets of data so that this can be measured bank to bank and so that we can actually support one another in that, in that uh, effort? Um, and then fundamentally, how do we work with our other partners, whether they're development finance institutions or NGOs or other banks, um, to be building, again, I think about it as an ecosystem opportunity or the idea of all of us are sort of running a race in the right direction. We might be the last leg in some ways of the handoff. And so how do we make the right intersection points so that um, each of us can hand the baton to each other at the right point and we know when and where that can happen so that that, that that transition happens in the right way and then we can support ultimately what we're trying to do here, which is help humans and the environment. It's so easy to lose track of that when you're talking about big capital. Thanks very much, Elsa. You, you hit on a topic I really wanted to cover with a number of our participants, which is around measurement, and I mean that a couple of different ways, but maybe I'll start uh, Taryn, pull you into the conversation, your organization, Measurement Matters. Maybe tell the group a bit more about your work, but as we're talking about measuring uh, social environmental impacts, I know this is at the core of what your organization uh, is looking to help investors, other organizations sort of come to terms with uh, smart ways of thinking about that and activating that. So would welcome your participation. Yeah, sure. Thanks a lot. Um, so my name is Taryn Wolf. I'm the director and the founder of Measurement Matters, and we're a social, environmental, and financial management company. Um, so I think, you know, one of the most important things um, when talking about impact is talking about not only measurement, but also management. I think one of the huge problems today in the development world is the measurement issue, that it's always an evaluation, right? That it's after the investment was done and whether it worked or not is not really an issue once it's over, right? So we really focus on measuring to manage impact. And I think this has two really um, key benefits, especially when we're talking about innovative finance. And I'd like to take Will's example of nutrition first and talk a little bit about a project from an experience that we had in Colombia, working on a nutrition project, using measurement to manage impact, but also to create better partnerships for social impact. Um, so in Colombia, we were working on a project that was run by a group of community mothers, and there were already a set of indicators that were set up to bring in investors for social impact bonds, um, which were all based around nutrition. And so when we went in to set up the indicators for this particular project, we found that there was a lot more value being created than what was actually being accounted for. And so for this this particular situation, considering how big the problem was and how many people needed to be impacted through this program, the payer never really had enough funds to be able to reach everybody that they needed to reach, if we're only looking at nutrition as one of the benefits, as the only thing that's being measured. 
So when we went to the community and we started talking to people, we found out that there was a lot more value being created that wasn't just nutrition. We were also working with community mothers, providing stable jobs for women who would otherwise not have access to formal employment. Um, there were benefits that were stability and peace building. And so why is this important for partnerships? Because at that point, there was one person who was going to pay for those outcomes. But now, once we find out what all of this value is, there are a lot more investors that are interested in investing in this project. For example, if if we have uh, formal employment for women, we have a couple of people here at the table who might be interested in investing in this project. Um, if we're looking at peace building, there were a lot of other actors that had funds for peace building that could also be um, brought into this partnership, whether for de-risking or for growing the program, but making sure that the investors got their, the appropriate returns that were agreed upon, but that also the impact, the full impact was, was reached as well. Um, another thing that I think is really important is the management aspect. A lot of times when we talk about <laughs> measurement, we do a projection and then we just kind of leave it by the wayside and then we might do an evaluation at the end of the program to see if it worked or not. And then maybe we might go for a second round of funding for that particular program or not. But I think if we think of impact measurement as a management tool and something that can help us maximize all of the value within our portfolio, including financial value, um, then it becomes a really important operational tool. And so if we treated, if we would treat social and environmental value as we do financial value, especially when we're talking about innovative finance, I think that we have an opportunity to create way better partnerships, but also a lot more social value through the investments that we're making, regardless of it's a, if, if it's a government institution, if it's a nonprofit, um, or if it's a large investment bank. Thanks, Darren. Um, I want to turn to some of our donor colleagues, or donor organization colleagues, to talk about some new measurement tools using. Before I do that, Rob, I wanted to pull you into the discussion and kind of, you know, two pieces. One, um, with the work that your organization is doing in terms of engaging uh, entrepreneurs and innovators on the ground developing world and training them and helping them to uh, you know achieve scale and success just maybe offering some observations about how do you measure progress uh, in those partnerships you have um, but also then tying back into the discussion that we were having earlier about how are we mobilizing capital uh, to these pockets and least developed countries that have a need that's not being met you know, how do you guys look at that as you're you're on the ground you're working with these SMEs you're training them up um, to help them achieve more scale. What's, what's your perspective in terms of the access to capital questions? So two questions for you. Two big questions, too. Um, although I guess one of the advantages to, uh, to being one of the, the last folks to speak is that I get to hear everybody else's ideas and, and riff off those. Um, and to be honest, it's really exciting to be here in large part um, because a lot of you around this table are folks who we've spoken with or um, certainly our organizations have collaborated or allies in the space, um, which I think is great and really exciting from this kind of innovative financing perspective. I also think it flags up something, which is it's still a really small community of people who are kind of experimenting and, and getting creative in this space. Um, but uh, just to um, give a quick high level overview of Village Capital. So, we're a seed stage fund and accelerator, and we focus on uh, trying to change the power dynamics in venture capital uh, in the US, but then also in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and South Asia. And uh, we actually take, we're an example of a blended finance approach. Um, our fund was set up uh, thanks in part to support from USAID, who provided us with a PACE grant to help cover some of the, um, the management fees on that uh, and make it a more compelling uh, investment for our LPs. Through that structure, we've been able to invest in about 115 companies uh, around the world. We've been able to support about 1,200 entrepreneurs. Um, and I think one of the exciting things, again, sort of being at this table, is the fact that normally when I'm at these sorts of discussions talking about innovative financing, uh, there's, if I'm there, I'm half the time the only person who's talking about small companies, small ticket sizes, things like that. And there are some, obviously, stalwarts of the, the field here people who have a, a deep background in this space um, and far, far more experience than I do. So really excited to have kind of the, the entrepreneurship voice represented as well. Because I think that's a really crucial one when we're talking about um, LDCs in particular and building capacity there. We're talking about you know, maybe blended finance around an infrastructure project and there will be capacity building carve outs to ensure that local companies get some of that to, to execute on those projects and build that skill set and, and um, have some of that job creation going on locally. Um, but 
but that's tough to do if you don't have those companies right. there on the ground sort of growing and scaling and able to access support. And I think that gets into a second component, um, which and Bob, is- before you go, what's small and what's large for Village Capital? Small for us, well, um, it really kind of depends, but we often come in at that seed stage. So it's, it's um, companies who have just really developed their kind of minimum viable products. Um, they might have a little bit of revenue coming in, um, but they're really looking for that first tranche of institutional what's support. small in terms of your, your investment? We come in at around fifty to 100000 And what's big? Big for us is anything above that, um, but we do do uh, we do do follow Glad on. We, I just want to <laughs> but you. the um, I think kind of one critical component of that is that um, of, of what you just brought up, Jacqueline, is also that blended finance isn't and innovative financing isn't just about those transactions. It's not just about the capital structures. It's also about the process. And certainly, as investors, and I know Jacqueline, and Valerie, and, and Alex are sort of steeped in this kind of thinking. But we often hear investors talk about. Um, where they invest, what they invest in, but we rarely hear them talk about how they invest. And I think one of the exciting things about the blended finance, innovative financing discussion is that process innovation, which is starting to take place as well, thinking through different ways of deploying capital, thinking through uh, different ways of making decisions around uh, investments. Um, and I think also building out to, to something that Sean brought up earlier, kind of building out um, the ecosystems to have that virtuous circle coming around to, to make it self-sustaining. And, and obviously technical assistance is one key component of that. And we've seen a lot of really exciting um, partnerships play out in that space, which have helped, uh, I think, really accelerate the uh, ability of those ecosystems to support their entrepreneurs um, on their own without any sort of need for, for outside support. Um, DFID had a project last year where uh, they helped support 15 accelerators in Africa um, build out their sort of best practices, um, build out their investor networks, their mentor networks, their business models. And all of that um, is to really kind of help build out not the pipeline, which we often hear investors complain about saying there's not enough pipeline in Africa for me to invest in. Well, the, there is. But a lot of times there aren't the pipes there to get the entrepreneurs from that kind of idea stage to the seed stage to the kind of series A, whatever it might be. So, um, you know, DFID's taken a really active role in that through that initiative. And obviously we've seen others like IFC, USAID. But I think that that technical assistance component, you know, whether you're looking at it in the lead up to making an investment or whether you're looking at it from um, sort of the perspective of portfolio support and management is really kind of critical. And I think something that often gets left on the sidelines in these discussions. Please. Yeah, thank you for that, Rob. I think you brought up some really good points. And I want to build on something, kind of a combination of what you and Elsa brought up. And that is, um, so you know, we work with companies maybe the, the next stage after Rob, um, but then all the way, they scale all the way to being publicly traded. And we cannot in this room ignore what Elsa brought up, which is the private institutional capital, because that is trillions of dollars. And when we talk about collaborative partnerships, I'm willing to bet that all of us at this table are willing to work together and could find a way to work together. It's really difficult working with institutional capital. And when you look at the statistics, only 4% of institutional private equity is in the hands of women and diverse fund managers. Mm -hmm. That is a problem. And we have an initiative at Social Venture Circle trying to address that and solve for some of the impediments that the big capital asset holders are saying is the reason the money is not flowing to these fund managers. And the reason it's important, besides obvious reasons, but you know, when you talk about impact investors, in our community, our impact investors are diverse. We have a lot of women, and we have a lot of diverse uh, racial diversity and sexual diversity. Um, if, if you don't have that, then the company's getting funded and the project's getting funded tend not to look like that. And so we think it's a huge issue that needs to be addressed immediately. And um, I'm happy to talk you know, separately and offline on some of the initiatives and what we're trying to work at. But it's going to take a lot of us working together to move that capital, which is sort of old money stuck like a, trying to move a big ship. You know? But it is an important um, initiative, we think. Thanks, Bob. Bernardo. Did you want to chime in on the same topic? Yeah, I would co comment particularly on the measurement on the on the how to connect with the institutional investors and 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 particularly the measurement side of SDGs. So we we precisely because of the conversation we have with institutional investors on how to report on SDG uh, impact on our projects. We've been working with uh, in the last year with Sustainable Development Network and uh, that works with the United Nations doing the measurements of the uh, SDG for all the countries. 
developing a methodology, how to derive out of that a methodology that allows to measure in the infrastructure sector only the impact of dollar invested in a project in, in a country in Latin America, how it reduces to the, the gap to, to in that specific SDG. Mm -hmm. So we develop, we're launching actually tomorrow this with SDSN, uh, it's a toolkit for uh, investors in Latin America in private sector projects in infrastructure that allow us to set up a certain assign, a certain portfolio uh, and see where they want to contribute the most and they can have in addition to a financial return where they can be more effective in terms of reducing the gap by country or by re in the overall region. So it's, a, it's an interesting tool that we want happy to share then with you. Thank you. Yeah, I just, um, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, from your intervention, I'm, I'm kind of looking around and thinking, you know, where have you been all my life? Because really, actually, this is an, ex it is an extraordinary gathering because you would think that a lot more is being addressed around this table than in a lot of other gatherings that you, you see in terms of the real extent of, of need. I, I did want to say, though, on this issue of what you refer to as the pipeline and the pipes, um, I agree that there is tremendous pipeline, of course, in the LDCs. There's tremendous potential, particularly if we're all interested or able through these various instruments and in blending to start down at the $50,000, $100,000 level. I think there is still a considerable weakness in our architecture around these project preparation facilities, around the accompaniment, um, the identification and accompaniment of the viable um, entrepreneurs' proposals around their management capacities, around their capacities to be able to put viable financial portfolios together, around the readiness and willingness of domestic banks to even look at and think about investing in their own local economies rather than taking their excess liquidity and putting it in you know, real estate markets in the capital city or offshoring it completely. So there's still a lot of pipes, what you're calling pipes, connections that are not quite happening, even possibly putting together um, with a project preparation facility an aggregator role so that not everybody has to go into the small scale stuff for us we're a kind of hybrid development and capital entity. So for us, the labor costs of doing a lot of small scale stuff doesn't have an effect on our bottom line or on our returns at all because we're a development entity applying capital instruments. But for a lot of organizations, obviously that has a tremendous impact. So how would we be able to create some kind of a, um, a project preparation facility and create pipes that are gonna work at scale for a wider range of partners that can help uh, create the pass-through mechanisms to make all of this more interesting. And I think part of that is new instruments and new innovations around aggregating instruments, around credit lines in domestic banks with guarantees that sit behind them, a whole, a whole range of other types of incentivizing instruments. I love what you're saying. Um, and we're actually building a, 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 a global academy for moral entrepreneurial leadership um, where we can really start to look at the skills that are needed that we've seen um, because some our big successes are always really big they come from betting on the right character much more than the right business plan and how can we start to build networks as well for these young entrepreneurs around the world um, I do want to say though I think one of the mistakes that we made in acumen early on we understood the need for readying entrepreneurs, we understood the need for patient capital, and we thought 10 years sounded pretty patient. Um, when you're working in highly illiquid markets, which is what most of us are working in for the poor, um, and you start to get to 10, 12 years before you get a liquidity event, um, we had thought we would have gotten more leverage and that it would be less expensive to actually manage. I love the, we use the word accompaniment as well, Judith. And, and what you find is that a little bit like little kids, you think all the fronts, are, the co costs are going to be in years one, two, and three, and then the kid hits 11, and it's just a disaster. And um, w you see some of that as well as these companies are starting to look at series B, C, and D, but they haven't had a liquidity event. And so we also not only, we don't just need the $50,000 early, we actually need to find the right kind of capital that will help us carry these investments for 10 or 12 
or 15 years in some cases, and then we need the right kind of takeouts. Because I do think, to your point, Rob, I do think there is more capital looking a little bit, your point, but tangentially, um, than there are entrepreneurs. There's a conference going on right now in Kenya where there are more uh, impact investors, that there are companies that showed up, and it was all about a venture fair. And so you're, you're, we're seeing crazy valuations as well that, that neither serve the entrepreneur well nor do they serve the market well. And all of these dysfunctions really need to be addressed, and they're only going to be addressed collaboratively as we look at the different tranches that are needed based on real data, which we, we finally have. And so I also just want to take my hat off to having this kind of conversation, because that people are thinking about blended capital is really exciting. Um, and then, sorry, Domna, I just need to say one thing for you, because the way we do impact um, measurement is using, um, we have something called lean data, where we text five, 6,000 customers simultaneously. We ask them a series of questions from which we can deduce not only their income levels, but um, how a specific intervention, a specific co uh, company is serving or isn't serving them. And we get extraordinary levels of feedback and data. And I'm actually wondering, in the kind of work that you're doing, which is so multi-layered, that there may be more direct ways that we can interact with those we're trying to serve that can give us real insight to then structuring the, the right kinds of financial services and, um, and what you're also talking about is job creation um, for them. And so um, I just wanted to throw that impact piece into. Sorry, may, may I ask before you, you close your speech, um, so how? I apologize. Oh, I didn't mean it. I didn't no, mean to go your off. Intervention. I'm sorry about that. But how does the? It's, it's going to be short from my side. Um, but how how does the feedback that um, that you do absorb from these questionnaires, for example, feeds in into uh, into a better alignment of, of of interests in the projects where you're involved? Well, I don't want to take up t too much room, so we can probably take yes. that off. But in in short. If you're looking for impact in the energy sector and not just financial returns, by asking your customers, are, how much more light are you getting? Is your income changing? What is your income level? Not only can we um, have a, a better understanding of whether the companies are actually doing what they think they're doing, which in often cases they're not, but then we can benchmark across an industry and help and, and make decisions based on how companies stack up against each other in terms of the social impact that we're looking at, not just the financial impact. Are there any more comments on this topic? Because I did want to move back to a bit about measurement, but I don't want to do that if there was any other reaction here. Not, not seeing that. Um, uh, so on the measurement side, I recognize that we've got different types of institutions represented around the table. I, I did want to get a little bit of the public sector perspective. Maybe between Sean and Katie, we can have a little colloquy of sorts here around um, you know, some efforts uh, on performance measurement. So the MCC, when it was stood up, it kind of quickly became the pride and joy of the U.S. government in terms of uh, modern and best practice and performance measurement. Uh, I haven't followed that narrative as closely as I should have, Sean, in you know, the last several years. So it would be great to hear from you about you know, MCC's approach to impact evaluation. I will say, you know, someone who is, comes at this from the advocacy space, about five or seven years into the MCC, when these first compacts were coming to conclusion, which are five-year in general compacts, there was a lot of anxiety about if it wasn't all going to be a sterling success, how would their funder, the United States Congress, respond? And there was a really active debate uh, in the development policy community, community in the United States, so those who understood MCC about the importance of honesty and acknowledging failure in some respects, but I'm just curious about you know, over the last five, seven years, and as you've assumed the, the leadership position there, how you now see that dynamic. Sure, uh, a couple of points. First, the monitoring and evaluation on all our compacts runs for 20 years, and so the actual, the extent of time that that runs out is longer than the agency's been in existence. So we haven't yet reached that first 20 year. But we package that information in a lot of ways. We, uh, we produce a star report. We produce a new product evaluation briefs to try to make the impact of our investments uh, more accessible to the public. Uh, but in terms of the data and the economic rates of return and this, the analysis that we do internally, we have we collect a large volume of data, and what we are 
trying to do right now, and this is something that I'm uh, trying to help the agency do as well, is a knowledge management system in order to plug in with all of the people at this table and give you access to that information and perhaps uh, more insight into the sorts of environments that we're all trying to be, we're all trying to be helpful with. Thanks, John. And then, so MCC, even 15 years old, relatively new agency within the U.S. government in the development context, OPIC pushing 50, um, but about to be sort of reinvigorated as the Development Finance Corporation. Katie, maybe you could share a little bit about this process that you and the leadership team at OPIC have undergone around creating a new development impact framework and what's been driving that. Yeah, so since 1971, we've had the same development matrix that gives a, a development score to the different uh, projects that we're going to underwrite, and that score uh, helps inform our investment committee on if we're going to move forward with the decision. As we move forward to the DFC, we've undertaken um, a a complete revamp of the entire development matrix. It's actually no longer called a development uh, matrix. We're uh, branded it as the IQ, the impact quotient. And we've tried to take the best and the brightest ideas from the entire development and impact community, many of the people around this table. So thank you so much for your input to that. Um, the one thing that we've always said is, with all that input and all of our dedication to getting it right, the one thing we know is we've gotten it wrong. Um, so it remains an iterative approach. Um, but I do think that um, one theme coming out of this conversation is this idea of the radical collaboration that we can get from admittedly the small group of people that are so committed to this impact investing space, um, we are committed to learning from each other and being transparent and admitting when uh, we may not quite have it right. Thanks, Katie. And then, Alex, I wanted to turn to you as well. I mean, this is a lot of your professional background in terms of <laughs> evidence and evaluation. And GIF is a, is a young um, institution, five years in now, I know has, has put a, a ton of focus on this. What maybe some observations you could share about how GIF approaches impact evaluation. Yeah, thank you very much. You know, in some ways, I think that we're informed a lot by what MCC has done. When I first came to GIF, I thought, well, we're going to reinvigorate good old project finance like they used to do at the World Bank in the 80s, and we're going to measure social rates of return on investment, and it's going to be great. And then I quickly realized that, you know, you can maybe do that with a power plant with an offtake agreement or a, a road, and you can model that out. But our mission was to invest in innovation, where by definition, the impacts are 10 years from now. And what's happening today is of, of interest, but that's not where all of the impacts really gonna be generated. And so we've worked hard to think about a measurement of impact that keeps your eye on the ball of the future. And to the extent that innovation is what you are aiming for, then to think about that really hard is what our challenge is. The other challenge that we have, it's a little bit, it's related to what lean data does, but we work across many sectors. And so we need to be able to compare innovations that provide behavioral change messages to mothers and investments that avoid closed head wound injuries of motorcycle taxi passengers. Those are just very different um, things. And so we've worked hard to get to an apples to apples estimate of impact that focuses on the big things that really matter, but where we can talk about welfare gains for people. Um, and as I sort of get along in my own career, I do come from a world of the randomized controlled trial as um, a critical aspect in helping us make decisions. And we continue to fund impact evaluations a lot at GIF, as the MCC does, I know. Um, and it's a very helpful tool um, for helping to get your thinking straight about what really drives impact. But it's a tool, and it's only one of many, and I think that being very ruthlessly pragmatic, especially when you're engaging with the private sector about what should be measured and why, um, is what matters the most rather than sort of purity of, of approach. Thanks, Alex. Uh, Laura, if I could turn to you. I, I did want to sort of get the perspective of KPMG's work in this space, and I know you're helping with the, the advisory services they provide to a broad cross-section of public and private sector actors are trying to advance the SDGs and achieve development. And you bring a tremendous wealth of experience from the World Bank and helping to lead the Italian Development uh, Agency. 
maybe you could tell us a bit about what, what is KPMG doing to help actors like these around the table and others to have more success in achieving impact? Well, many things because we work with many actors. <laughs> so I was just listening to uh, you know the, the the previous speakers as they were talking about measurement. This is obviously something that uh, you know we do very actively, um, always working with uh, you know different type of institutions, whether these are private sector entities or public sector, uh, trying to shift uh, from the idea that you measure exposed to the fact that you actually have to have a continuum in measurement that will allow you basically to catch your mistakes at a very early stage to correct your direction, et cetera. And so we have developed various tools that uh, you know, can be applied in different contexts and that really help uh, you know, guiding the decision. In a way, measurement is only useful as it is a kind of an active tool that then guides investment, decision, managerial strategies, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then the other things that we try to do, uh, going back to one of the topics that is particularly uh, dear to me, having worked for so many years uh, you know, in Africa and working on fragile economies and uh, um, you know, the big infrastructure gap, is really try to concentrate on what are the keys to success of public-private partnership. This is a topic in which uh, you know, we have looked at that from many different dimensions. We work with financial organizations. We work with private sector. We work uh, with construction firms. We work with uh, multilateral banks, et cetera, et cetera, and really try to distill uh, what is the good recipe, what are the do's and the don'ts, and to try to see whether we can consolidate this knowledge and put it at the surface service of others so that, that this process, which is already complex in itself, uh, you know, gets accelerated. And then the third thing on impact investing, since, uh, you know, we are uh, we like to believe that we are a firm that basically is based on knowledge, because if we don't have good knowledge, nobody will request our services. So on impact investing, we have also tried to uh, create a kind of an internal mechanism that facilitates and centralizes learning. One of the problems that we have with organizations that are as large as ours is that knowledge gets dispersed because there are so many different places and so we really try to have center of excellence and so we are really trying to consolidate uh, what the knowledge is in terms of impact investing. We started from the definition because so many times uh, you know we use words but we mean different things and so it's very important that uh, you know we have the lexicon right and then we are now really working on this issue of measurement. We're working with private equity firms that obviously have invested in uh, uh, impact investing funds and really trying to see what we are learning from this particular experiences. So. Please. May I, a quick parenthesis on the, on, on the measurement issue. Um, whereas as an economist, I would love to be able to argue in favor of the optimal allocation of funds and for doing so, you need to incorporate the whole concept of measurement. The issue is that at times, and I'm saying this as an allocator of funds, given the, 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 um, the ministry where I'm working at, and an allocation of funds to the most vulnerable, to all these um, private institutions that do care for the most vulnerable parts of society, the measurement at times, and this is where reality is, is a reality check, the measurement at times is a luxury. So talking about ex ante or staged or exposed measurement is a luxury, because otherwise, what are you going to do? You are th these groups of population, they're completely dependent on you. So putting this into the equation as a factor that um, we do need to care about measurement for sure, but what is the optimal way of when you are, um, when you are called to manage something that does have its own um, modus operandi, basically, how can you insert to what you have inherited measurement in? And at times, and what I've inherited, this is not the easiest thing in the planet to do. So. What I might propose, Valerie, you'll, I'll pull you into this, is we've only got about eight minutes left, and I'd love to give everybody a chance to maybe offer some very short comments and just sort of go around the table. I would sort of tee that up in two ways. One, you know, if there was a, a burning issue you wanted to raise and could succinctly just put it into the discussion, but again, 45 seconds you know, in total talking here. And then secondly, recognizing that, again, Concordia has a, an innovative financing coalition, and they want to take this forward, and they want this to be actionable. So if you have any advice that we can send back to our host, Concordia, with regard to good ways to carry this forward, um, and maybe we'll just go around this way, and Elsa, I'll start with you. 
Oh gosh, there's so much I could say. Okay, um, I'd say just a couple things quickly. Picking up on the concept of innovation and going back to my original point about changing the banking industry from the inside out, we're trying on our own mechanisms to drive new, um, new products and services from the inside out. I run a, a little venture fund for entrepreneurship inside Barclays, which is one of the coolest things we've got going, honestly. And it's, it's ended up yielding a number of, um, of products that have grown substantially in the last few years, including a, a social and impact banking coverage team. Um, which now can pick up and support uh, high growth uh, companies that might have some special needs or, or, or new opportunities that might not be naturally picked up by our other coverage teams, but which can be propelled forward and actually are highly commercial and highly profitable. Um, I think I'd also just return to this idea of how do we find the right intersection points. Uh, I, I think I sort of now live at the end of the chain in terms of having big capital to allocate, but needing to make sure that we can do that in a way that, that makes sense inside um, a large and old uh, institutional investment scheme. And so how might we work, you know, if you're doing the handoff from 50 to 100K, there's a wide gulf between us. <laughs> how do we make sure that we can connect those, those spaces so that then we can pick up on the $100 billion opportunity and, and you know, bridge the two or $100 million opportunity? Um, I, I'll leave it at that to make it succinct. Thank you. Yeah, I'd probably just uh, double down on that theme about um, collaborating to find the intersections. I think that that's really um, critical, and it's one of the things that um, we've seen a lot of in the, the impact investing space is this sort of fragmentation and the fact that in many ways, even though we'll um, connect over specific deals and transactions, there's still a lot of siloing about who's doing what and how we're supporting. And, you know, Village Capital is running a, a gender lens initiative right now to um, really identify best practices along with the IFC of how to support female entrepreneurs in uh, East Africa and India. And it's got some interesting data takeaways from that already in terms of um, the fact that uh, female entrepreneurs continue to face challenges in terms of raising capital when they go to investors. But a lot of times, their revenue outperforms that of, of their male peers. Um, and so there's some interesting takeaways there about thinking to a point that Jacqueline raised earlier, how what sort of structures we're investing in, what kind of liquidity events we're looking for, and does an equity uh, liquidity event make sense for that sort of thing? But then. How does Village Capital collaborate with Acumen Fund on that or with OPIC or with some of the larger uh, institutions around the table? And I think that having these sorts of discussions is a good starting point, but trying to figure out how to, to really kind of be open about sharing um, what we're seeing work and what we're not seeing work is critical to that. First, first an apology that I have to leave right at 3.30, so um, I don't, I'm not sure we're going to get around the whole table, so if I leave, please don't think I'm being rude. Um, but the, so very quickly, investment as a means, not as an end, what does that mean? And then I wonder if Concordia could think about um, helping us actually understand who does what in the space and what kind of capital is searching to be used because this is a new world. We've never had all this kind of capital around. And so it's so thrilling to me, but I'd love to know, I'd love to have an easy guide as to where I might find partners that we can help, can put these different entities together, so. Thank you very much for organizing. It was great talking to everyone. I want to touch uh, as a, an initial mobilization of resources in the local capital markets. This uh, a topic is very important in Latin America because we have a growing amount of resources in pension funds uh, and insurance in our markets. And Concordia has a regional meeting in Colombia that actually we use less, uh, this year to mobilize resources for migration initiative for a blending instrument that we develop also to partner with TENT and many private sector companies. So we think for next year it could be very interesting how we can work together. Uh, using an instrument that we have, for instance, called Index America, which is a corporate sustainability index that we're developing for the region to develop uh, bonds, to issue bonds linked to that index, but also to work with local capital markets, as we did with the low, uh, stock market in Argentina, and we're doing it with Mexico. And how we can use more guarantees and an instrument that allow to mobilize resources from local capital markets in SDG bonds, green bonds, and uh, gender uh, bonds. Thank you. Yeah, I can't believe that this is over already. It went by really fast. And actually, it went by so fast that I'm looking at all these notes that I made that I didn't even um, share with you guys. So I'd be really happy to share that afterwards and continue this conversation because um, we're actually working a lot with the Innovative Finance Coalition in Latin America. Um, and another thing that I just realized is that we talked almost the entire time about impact investing, and we didn't really talk that much about 
all the other tools that we could use for innovative financing and impact investing is just one of those. Um, so I think there are a lot of opportunities for all the experience that you guys have uh, for us to work together to bring all of this to the table and to the Finance Coalition as well. So afterwards, um, rather than give some more kind of you know, anecdotes or <laughs> more another statement, um, I would really like to invite you guys to come and talk afterwards, speak with me or someone from Concordia or my partner, Luke, as well. I'm kind of feeling like this may feel a little bit like a, a tangent, but I'm going to attach it to your comment, Bernardo, and make people think it's connected <laughs> more. But it's, a, it's an issue that's really, I've been giving a lot of thought, thought to. Um, the largest population of people entering poverty in both developed and developing countries are old people, are people in, over the age of, of 60. And the vast majority of them are engaged in the informal sector, so they do not have any hope of a more organized pension. And I think there's some fascinating work, but there could be even more work and more attention about getting that capital into local capital markets. because. The, the size of that problem would absolutely dwarf government budgets. Budgets, uh, you know, uh, governments are not going to be able to provide a social security or a livable um, retirement income. But even minimal, a dollar a day, um, investments that are started by a young woman at the age of 20, even if she's coming in and out of the workforce and all of the, you know, living longer than, than men, she can have a livable wage if it's invested you know, from from an early age at even you know fairly fairly modest returns. So just sort of, I know we're talking about how much capital there already is. Maybe we're bringing more capital in, but I do think it's a, a critical issue um, of of poverty alleviation and potentially deepening capital markets. Um, I think in terms of what Concordia might be able to support with moving forward, um, from our perspective, what Taryn and others said about um, just standardization of metrics, um, I think is a, is a need that we're really grappling with. with. And um, coming into this space, thinking about uh, nutrition, it baffles me that, um, you know, after upwards of a billion dollars that have been spent on uh, private sector solutions, food system solutions for nutrition, that there are not standardized metrics for how we actually measure what nutrition impact means when we're, when we're using those solutions and, and, and those channels. Um, and so I think we just need those. I mean, I, don't, I really don't, it shouldn't be very hard to just talk with folks on the investment side to see what's feasible in terms of metrics, talk to folks on the technical side for all of the sectors that we're working in to understand what matters most in terms of lives saved, human development, and just have some, some standard metrics that we can, we can start using moving forward. Thanks. Well, I'm going to say the moderator's prerogative to ignore the blinking red light that was there. So you guys continue, um, and we'll, we'll wrap it up. Thank you. Okay, quick point on Mary's intervention, um, which I think is an interesting disclaimer. So on the absolutely essential role of, um, of pension contribution in, uh, in lower um, income countries, I want to mention that, in fact, now in the majority of southern European countries, we do suffer from the opposite because of the opposite demographic trend of shrinking populations, we really need to convince people that at some point, all the contributions that they put towards their pension are going to actually become a pension because they've lost trust in actually receiving some. So we do have the, the reverse effect of evading pension contributions with regards to when they're employing someone. So my small contribution to what Concordia can take out of it, I think it's, uh, it's, it's small but essential. I think it's important to establish a chapter in each kind of research assessment that does take place prior to any kind of financing decision for any, any tool. And this would be the alignment of interests um, of all involved stakeholders, whether these are direct and indirect, um, which I think from my short experience is essential in building some kind of partnership. Thanks. Um, well, what I was going to suggest is that maybe Concordia can help us going a little bit more in-depth into this conversation in a sense that uh, by now I feel that we have reached a stage over a decade of implementing different uh, you know, approaches to innovative financing where we can actually start drawing the lessons. And so maybe, I mean, it's fantastic that you have this group of people around the table for an hour and a half. I mean, we remain very much in the surface on the topic. So maybe you can uh, be the facilitator of this learning, and we will be delighted to help. Uh. 
No, I'll second that. I think the communication is important. This has been great. Um, Jacqueline's, I have an 11-year-old. It would have been great 10 years ago to get that advice. Um, <laughs> but I think uh, MCC is really the, the U.S. government stamp of approval on a government that's going in the right direction. And we need to better understand from all of you the sort of um, enabling environment that's required on your end to de-risk investment. And it would be great if you all had better visibility into what our projects are, our development, uh, and how we work. So I'd love to continue talking. Thank you. Um, and I want to build on something that Jacqueline said, even though she had to leave. Um, at Social Venture Circle, we have been asked by our membership uh, to fill a gap in the impact investing um, ecosystem in mapping it, uh, creating a, a, a directory, because there is not a real alignment service. Um, and as a nonprofit, we would be for the public benefit. And so we would invite anyone to join forces with us on that. We've already started that project. Um, you know, there aren't that many advocates in the impact investing space. Like um, Barclays and Elsa, you have one of the first um, investment banks of a large bank focused on that. And so uh, we just think it is important to have that mapping tool so we know who is doing what and that would help with alignment. So I again invite anyone to um, come talk to me about partnerships, about anything we've talked about and I would love to continue the conversation as many people have suggested here. Great, well thank you and I, I agree that um, uh, would love to continue the conversation. Actually a number of you are gonna be hearing from me after this because I, I think there are a lot of great lessons and, and, um, and ideas around the table. Um, Maybe I would just end by, you know, sort of recalling that the sustainable development goals are, are designed to be an integrated um, uh, set of goals that all interact with one another. Um, every transaction that we talk about here is important, but no single transaction is going to get us to where we need to get. And so when we talk about uh, all of the collective work of what we're doing and bringing it together and so on. It's really about making sure of two things. And one is that we're, um, we're creating value uh, towards goals that go well beyond individual transactions and well beyond the individual investor. Um, and two, we're about creating value for those local economies. We're not about extracting value from those local economies. We need to be really focused on what is the value that we're leaving behind ultimately on the impact side. Um, that's really important. And in countries where um, they don't have access to all of these types of instruments and tools for investment and for uh, and they don't have mature capital markets and so on. A lot of what we want to be thinking about, um, and we are thinking about it, and I think it's great, is how do we bring that to scale in a way that's really going to have help these countries graduate out of, for instance, their least developing country status with greater equality and with a greater distribution of resources, financial uh, possibilities, and capital across their entire um, economies and across their populations when they make that graduation step. Thank you. Thanks, Judith. So I'll, I'll close succinctly by mainly just thanking uh, our participants for taking the time to come here today to share your expert perspectives uh, and additionally for, in the end, uh, showing a vote of confidence and a willingness to continue to work with Concordia to carry this forward. So I'll close by asking the audience to join me in a round of applause for our participants. Thank you.